Great. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Adam Bagg, who is a professor of pathology at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, originally, uh, Dr. Bagg was actually invited by uh, Dr. Mahmoud Halifa to come speak. Uh, for those of you that didn't know this, Dr. Halifa spent a year at Georgetown between 94 and 95, and he and Dr. Bagg became friends and colleagues and have been in contact ever since. Uh, Dr. Halifa was unable to introduce Dr. Bagg, but uh, asked me if I would do it. And uh, I met Dr. Bagg originally in 2011 when he came out to Seattle to give a talk at Phenopath, and we've communicated at the professional meetings. Um, so it's really my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bagg. He is originally from um, South Africa, and he went to medical school at the University of Witwatersrand. Uh, and he subsequently came to, uh, to the United States in 1989 to gain additional training and spent a decade at George Washington University where he did residency and fellowship. Uh, he was the director of hematopathology there and subsequently locate, uh, relocated to the University of Pennsylvania. And I think Dr. Bagg has really been a leader in, in two primary areas, uh, hematopathology as well as molecular hematopathology. And um, he uh, has been very, very prolific in uh, leading the diagnostic field of hematopathology, leading kind of research in these areas and also just being a really fabulous educator, as you're gonna see, he's a really engaging speaker and has gotten a lot of awards for his teaching as well as uh, being, quote, a top doctor in, in Philadelphia. And um, has been very, uh, very prolific in kind of the national societies. So without much further ado, I, I really uh, welcome your talk, Dr. Bagg, and look forward to what you have to tell us today about B-cells. Hi, can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Mike, for the kind introduction. Thank you for the dinner you arranged last night. It was wonderful getting together. I'm not sure if everybody knows that that actually took place. And I'm actually in my hotel in downtown Minneapolis. Um, and thanks for allowing me to do this from my hotel bed. Without further ado, I'm going to be trying to forward the slide. Give me one second. There we go. Um, so again, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Uh, in broad terms, I wanted to cover um, the molecular pathology of B cell uh, lymphomas, um, B cells behaving badly, a broader facet to the title being a better basis to behold belligerence in small B cell lymphomas and leukemias. And in keeping with the title uh, for the duration of this talk, and perhaps during question time, I'll be using my street name of bad boy bag. Now, if you think that's an abject and absolutely annoying abuse of alliteration, you should be fairly thankful that Dr. Khalifa's first choice for today's grand rounds, a Reverend James Nelson Hume, uh, was unable to um, make this event. And in fact, I was a last minute uh, call in to give this grand rounds. As you know, Jason, James Nelson Hume is a renowned hematopathologist who published a book on alliteration some time ago, and in his initial book of 2,000 words, every single word in that book uh, began with the letter A. He sends his apology from uh, beyond this uh, realm that he couldn't be here with us today. So I'm going to begin by just reviewing very quickly uh, the malleability of the immunoglobulin genes. Again, I just got to check that um, people can hear me. Otherwise, it would be odd if I gave the whole lecture and there was no one was hearing anything. Can you just tell me that I'm coming through okay? Yes, yeah, everything's you are. great, Thank Adam. You. Okay. We can't, we can't hear the crowd's laughter, but we, we are hearing your talk. So okay. it's good. I think I want to introduce some canned laughter and some shuffling and sneezing just to know that there's people out there. Anyway, as B cells develop from uh, early precursors in the bone marrow, uh, to circulating naive B cells and then into the germinal center, they ultimately have the capacity to differentiate into memory B cells and plasma, B, uh, plasma cells, as you know. Uh, this is not a completely unidirectional flow. We've learned uh, in the last decade or so that, in fact, movement in the germinal center, uh, things can go backwards and forwards, the cells in, in, in their differentiation and selection cycle from centrocytes to centroplasts. But aside from that, as these uh, B cells mature and differentiate, there are a number of phases where they're exposed to physiologic damage. Initially in the marrow, mediated by the RAG1, RAG2 enzyme complex, 
is VDJ recombination, a very important event in the generation of uh, immunologic diversity. Once the B cells hit the germinal center, there are two additional times in their lives where uh, DNA damage occurs, physiologic DNA damage, somatic hypermutation, SHM, and CSR, class switch recombination. Those, of course, are mediated by another enzyme, activation-induced cytosine deaminase. In addition, of course, we shouldn't forget about the role of TDT in further uh, generating immunologic diversity, uh, but that does not uh, damage the DNA per se. So there are three stages in normal B cell development, VDJ, SMH, SHM, and CSR, where DNA is physiologically damaged. And it's in those scenarios that these immuno, good immunoglobulin genes with the intent of generating diversity and uh, good uh, uh, antibody affinity can go bad. So we know that the 1418 translocation seen in follicular lymphoma, the 11-14 translocation in mantle cell lymphoma, amongst others, occur at the time of VDJ recombination in the bone marrow. Somatic hypermutation areas, errors may lead to a Burkitt lymphoma, MIC translocations, or BCL6 translocations in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And underlying some of these translocations listed here, Burkitt lymphoma, sporadic variety this time, some large cell lymphomas, and even some myelomas, errors in class switch recombination rejoining lead to these translocation events. And we're all then familiar with the role of 1418 uh, translocation associated with follicular lymphoma, 1114 with mantle cell, and MIC with Burkitt lymphoma. But I think a very important point to emphasize, surely familiar to all, but worth emphasizing, is unlike diseases like CML, for example, and currently seven types of AML, seven types of ALL, none of these translocations is required for diagnosis. And none of these translocations is diagnostically sensitive or specific, meaning you can diagnose follicular lymphoma, mantle cell lymphoma, many of the others in the absence of these translocations. It's nice to have them, but they're not essential for rendering the diagnosis. When we talk about small B-cell neoplasms, this is a shortish list, but I think a fairly comprehensive list of the entities one might think of in small B-cell lymphomas listed here. And we're going to go through most of them uh, during the course of the next three hours. And thank you very much for extending the time of this grand rounds. I do appreciate that. These small B-cell lymphomas have in common, they tend to be diseases of adults rather than pediatric diseases, a male uh, uh, predilection for most they are characterized in general by an expansion of monoclonal, uh, mature immunoglobulin positive B cells and a variable proclivity to involve the blood and bone marrow. And here they represented and easily recognized by regular h &E microscopy, follicular lymphoma, CLL, or here SL with pseudo follicular proliferation centers, a mantle cell lymphoma with a mantle cell growth pattern, a gastric mulch lymphoma, CLL, lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, and hairy cell leukemia. And that's important because many of these diseases, again, are easily recognized by simple microscopy, aided and abetted by immunophenotyping, uh, and uh, genetics is certainly not always required. Let's look in a little bit more detail at follicular lymphoma. We know it's associated with the 1418 translocation, but it's also important uh, to remember that only 85% of follicular lymphomas harbor the canonical 1418 translocation. 15% do not. And as you get into certain categories of follicular lymphoma, that 85% drops substantially. The flip side of that is uh, um, relevant as well in that not all lymphomas that harbor a 1418 translocation are follicular lymphomas, fully 25% of de novo. De novo, not transformed uh, diffuse large B cell lymphomas can harbor this translocation. So from a diagnostic point of view, the 1418 translocation is neither specific nor sensitive for the diagnosis of follicular lymphoma. We know that as many of the translocations over the years have had their genes cloned, uh, the proteins have been uh, discovered and antibodies generated against them. Importantly, the use of immunohistochemistry for BCL2 in the realm of uh, looking at lymph node specimens, uh, the most important point to make is that if a small B cell lymphoma expresses BCL2, that is absolutely not specific for follicular lymphoma. Any, and in fact, all small B cell lymphomas 
do overexpress BCL2 uh, for a variety of different reasons. More importantly, you might want to use BCL2 immunohistochemistry. chemistry hopefully not too much, but if you have trouble distinguishing follicular lymphoma from reactive follicular hyperplasia, we know that reactive physiologic germinal centers have BCL2 down-regulated or negative, whereas in neoplastic follicles, uh, BCL2 uh, is expressed. But importantly, I wanted to emphasize the fact that BCL2 protein overexpression definitely not specific for follicular lymphoma. And CLL, for example, and all the others can be positive. In rare cases, you may find the 1418 translocation by cytogenetics or FISH, and yet when you do immunohistochemistry for BCL2, it is negative. And that's uh, been well described. It's often due to a point mutation in the BCL2 gene, so that it um, essentially destroys an epitope, or there's no longer the epitope that can be recognized by a monoclonal antibody, and it's a false negative if you use alternative antibodies that recognize different epitopes, you will document uh, BCL2 uh, overexpression. And this is said to occur in up to a half of follicular lymphomas. Not all of these mutations affect the antibody ability to bind it. Not all of that ha have functional consequences. But it has been proposed that uh, patients with follicular lymphoma with BCL2 mutations over and above translocations are at greater risk for subsequent transformation. There's some theoretic concern, I'm not sure it's been proven yet, of therapeutic resistance if one were to use a BCL2 inhibitor like venetoclax, which is not really used to my knowledge that frequently in follicular lymphoma anyway. Talking about mutations, there are a whole host of other mutations that one can encounter in follicular lymphoma. I'll talk about this in more detail on the next slide but there has been proposed a seven risk gene model looking at these seven genes that can prognosticate at the time of diagnosis. This has been around for a while. It's been looked at in clinical trials. Hasn't yet had any impact in the routine clinical scenario. So it's not taken off as an important diagnostic or rather prognostic test. So we've seen that 85% of follicular lymphomas have the 1418. Of the 15% that don't, some are still protein positive for BCL2 because of increased copies of the gene or the whole chromosome. In the remaining cases, the most common translocation are those of BCL6. Uh, these tend to be BCL2 negative, obviously. They're more likely grade three, predominantly large cell, and can often express MUM1, which is not typically expressed in follicular lymphoma. Speaking of BCL2 follicular lymphomas, there are a number of scenarios, in fact, where you expect 1418 to be absent, even though we're making a diagnosis of follicular lymphoma. So as listed here, testicular, cutaneous, pediatric type, higher grade, diffuse inguinal follicular lymphomas, perhaps blastoid follicular lymphomas, if you believe in the entity, uh, are associated with 1418 negativity. The diffuse inguinal with deletions of 1P36, target gene is probably this TNF receptor superfamily gene 14, not specific for this entity. It's a very commonly mutated gene, actually in regular nodal follicular lymphoma, perhaps more specific in this context of STAT6 mutations. So as I mentioned, there's more to follicular lymphoma than just the 1418 translocation. The mutations, interestingly enough, that are enriched in follicular lymphoma are these listed here, which all affect histone to a greater or lesser degree, acetylation and sometimes methylation, very commonly seen, at least the ones at the top, and MEF2B. And these are actually early events in lymphoma genesis and occur at the time it is uh, posited uh, as a 1418 translocation, so being uh, acquired in the bone marrow. We know that follicular lymphoma has about a 1% or 2% per year risk of transforming to large cell lymphomas. It would be nice to predict those events, and in fact, there are studies that have shown if you have these mutations as listed here or other more gross cytogenetic abnormalities at the time of diagnosis of follicular lymphoma, they are more likely to transform. People have also described other mutations uh, that occur at the time of translocation of transformation to high-grade lymphomas. Still, however, these are not routinely looked at. People have proposed gene expression profiles predicting uh, high or low risk of transformation. As you would expect, when a follicular lymphoma transforms, you would expect that the cell of origin type would be germinal center B cell. After all, follicular lymphomas are a prototypic germinal center derived B cell lymphoma. However, fully 15% actually have an ABC, activated B cell uh, gene expression profile. These are terms that we use 
uh, fairly exclusively in the setting of characterizing, one way of characterizing diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And interestingly enough, those that acquire or seem to switch to an ABC phenotype have mutations, acquired mutations, that are enriched in de novo ABC diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So it's as if these acquired mutations kind of can alter the gene expression profile to look like that of an ABC. Let's talk a little bit about pediatric type follicular lymphoma, previously called pediatric follicular lymphoma. It's now known to be seen in the setting of um, um, adults as well. And this uh, table sort of highlights the differences between the classical adult type follicular lymphoma and pediatric type. So obviously age is a factor. Median age of uh, follicular lymphoma is sort of 50s and 60s. This is much younger. Very interestingly is the marked male predominance seen in pediatric type follicular lymphomas uh, with regard to stage, whereas adults often present with high stage disease. Pediatric type is low stage. And the opposite is true with regard to grade. Pediatric type follicular lymphomas are predominantly large cell. Most cases of follicular lymphoma in adults are lower grade. BCL2 expected in uh, adults. It is by definition negative in pediatric type. Proliferative fraction low versus high. Translocations we've covered in follicular lymphoma in adults. None of these three uh, translocation, in particular, obviously not the BCL2, is seen in pediatric type follicular lymphoma. It's more genomically simple. There are more uh, uh, copy number variants detected in, in adult uh, uh, follicular lymphoma. In fact, if you get to do a karyotype on follicular lymphoma, as I'm sure Betsy will attest to, um, you get crazy phenotypes, uh, so, excuse me, crazy complex chromosomal abnormalities in adult follicular lymphoma, even when they're relatively benign or indolent. Or, uh, yeah. uh, whereas you don't see this in the pediatric type, Mutations that are enriched in adult type, we've talked about histone modifying genes. Mutations in pediatric type two listed originally. I would take this one out now. The TNF receptor superfamily 14 mutation is found to be quite widespread in adult type two. But the MAP2K1, MAP kinase mutation, is particularly enriched and distinctive from the adult type. Clinically, we know that adult type is incurable with relapsing and remitting disease, whereas the pediatric type can be cured with local therapy. Okay, so now a brief interlude, and normally at this stage of the lecture, I would interact with the audience and get feedback from the audience. So I'm not sure how I'm going to do this, but I'll pretend I can hear you responding. And so my question to you is, um, or a bit of background is, I like to travel, and when I travel, um, one of the uh, particular things I like to do is to discover and explore local street art. So I don't know if anyone who's listening can tell me where I took this picture. Mexico City. Not Mexico City. Bangkok. Not Bangkok. Los Angeles. Not Los Angeles. <laughs> All right, so. Is that, Bans is that Bansky? I think it's a rip of a Bansky. You certainly got the Bansky S type thing and then other people have added things on top of it. You know, to know if it's an original Bansky or a rip off is always uh, difficult to tell. But thank you. Actually, I'm glad that people unmuted. I'll just show you some other pictures from the city. It may help you recognize the city I'm talking about. Any, any input? Never mind. This. Uh, so as I mentioned, I like uh, discovering street art. This street artist who has these Cheshire cats all over the city often puts them in places where you think, my God, how the hell did she or he get there to do that? And they could be, you know, high up on buildings that seem inex inaccessible. All right, so here, uh, the last uh, 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 picture I wanted to share with you, it's sort of a mashup between Vermeer and uh, Gwen Stefani. I'm sure you all recognize that in that city. Perhaps if you look at this picture, you can tell me what city I'm in. Anyone? London. Yes. Not London. Paris. 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 Why is it Paris? The Louvre. The Thank Louvre. You. Beautiful. So this is the entrance to the Louvre. I am pay. I am pay. Uh, designed uh, uh, entranceway to the Louvre, and so um, you know, there's tons of amazing, gorgeous things to see there. Botticelli's. The reason why I'm showing these pictures is um, we took our daughter to Europe a couple of years ago and she was terribly excited 
uh, to be going to Paris and seeing all these amazing museums and all the amazing art there. So he has a picture of her enjoying uh, the Louvre uh, one day. This is uh, the next day where she's savoring the artwork in the <laughs> museum. And uh, she actually is outside Sacre Coeur. So it was you know, quite rewarding for us as parents to have taken our daughter to enjoy all these uh, magnificent sites. Anyway, I digress. Let's go back to the uh, subject at hand, and that's chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Uh, usually easily considered, if not diagnosed in a peripheral blood smear, predominance of small mature lymphocytes that are fragile, and so when the smear is made, may pop open to give smudge cells or basket cells. Though not that well illustrated in this picture, the characteristic chromatin pattern in CLL is referred to as soccer ball or for the Europeans or rest of the world, football uh, type chromatin, cracked mud, ginger snap. Anyway, the characteristic immunophenotype I think most of us are familiar with, with the DIM20, the DIM immunoglobulin, co-expression of 5 and 23, uh, usually fairly straightforward in making the diagnosis. Um, other useful markers that have emerged over the last couple of years are looking at CD200. And in fact, we've supplanted uh, CD23 uh, with CD200 as a way to help distinguish CLL from mantle cell, for example, and it has other utilities. And of course, in tissue sections, a fairly useful uh, and robust marker, I think, is LEF1. Uh, be that as it may, uh, not all uh, CLLs present as leukemia. About 5% present with pure lymph node involvement, with the classical illustrated here, uh, cloudy sky appearance of the pseudo-follicular proliferation centers that are so characteristic of this disease. Uh, there's been a recent resurgence in pseudo-follicular proliferation centers uh, of late, with some people uh, pointing to these and their size and confluence as prognostic factors. And if they're broader than a 20x microscopic field, that's a bad prognosis. As we all know, CLL, we give it one name, one disease, is very heterogeneous and patients behave quite differently. There are many conventional parameters, some of which are, of course, still useful, like clinical and hematologic staging, but some novel or rather novelish parameters have emerged in the last, not very recent future, but I think are important to uh, review. And I'm referring to the cytogenetics of CLL, the cell of origin of CLL, and mutations that are found in CLL. So with regard to uh, cytogenetics, um, I'm going to ask um, Pavel. Is Pavel in the audience? Hello? Can anyone, okay, can anyone can volunteer to tell me what this shows being the most commonly seen cytogenetic profile in patients with CLL? Anyone? Adam, I'm sending Pavel a text to nudge him, but we've got some other great cytogeneticists on the line with us. Okay. Well, no, it's not for the cytogeneticists. It's easy peasy for them. Hematopathologists should be able to read cytogenetics too. 13Q and 4 deletion. Pardon? 13Q and 4 deletion. So, in fact, this is normal cytogenetics. It's not the world's best um, uh, carrier type. Um, but what I'm trying to illustrate is that the majority of patients in whom you do regular cytogenetics without mitogens, which shouldn't happen in, in these days, uh, is going to show you a normal carrier type. So I wanted to highlight that this was a normal carrier type and there's a need to go fishing, as you well know. So um, the most common, as you mentioned, uh, uh, abnormality is a deletion of 13 q 14 that's seen in over one half of cases. Deletion 11Q22 in about one fifth of cases. Trisomy 12 before the advent of fish, the most commonly described cytogenetic abnormality, but on carrier type rather than by fish uh, on metaphase analysis uh, in about one in six patients. And variably present deletion of 17P13. And we all know why it's important to detect these cytogenetic abnormalities by fish ideally, and that's because of these kaplan meier curves, now 20 years old, but still very robust in terms of their importance. 17P deletion taking out P53, probably the worst type of cytogenetic abnormality in CLL. 11Q deletion, also a relatively bad prognosis, targeting probably ATM, maybe Burke 3 and 13Q14 
13 Q14 deletions targeting uh, two micro RNAs associated with the best prognosis in terms of what we can glean from cytogenetics. We uh, uh, always think of 13 Q14 deletions as being good prognosis, which they usually are. Some caveats to that, too, I wanted to mention that not all 13 Q deletions are the same. In the early days of discovery of this abnormality, people were using larger than appropriate probes that might have spanned uh, the retinoblastoma gene. And if you're using the wrong probes, which doesn't happen nowadays, hopefully, at all, um, you will actually not have a good prognosis. And I wonder how many people actually look at the percentage of cells that harbor the 13Q134 deletion. Uh, there are a number of studies showing that if there are large amounts of cells, in one study, more than 70% of nuclei harboring this otherwise good uh, fish abnormality, it's actually associated with a bad prognosis. I don't know how many people pay attention to that, but there's more than one study. Immunoglobulin translocations, common in follicular lymphoma, common in mantle cell, common in Burkitt, et cetera, are rare in CLR, but they certainly are seen. Most of them are associated with a bad prognosis. Curiously, you, the BCL2 translocation, and again, highlighting that it's not specific for um, follicular lymphoma, can really be seen in CLL, and those tend to be good. As with AML, for example, unsurprisingly, the more complex the cytogenetics, the worse the disease. Classically defined as three or more uh, abnormalities. More recently, five or more abnormalities in the setting of CLLs with greater uh, complexity uh, is particularly bad. Uh, we know from sequencing studies that a number of genes are currently mutated in CLL as listed here. They are not huge in terms of uh, percentage abnormalities in CLL. So low numbers of uh, low percentages of these mutations are found, unlike, for example, other mutations which are much more commonly found in certain diseases that we'll get to shortly. Uh, the T53 and ATM mutations often accompany the deletions. MED12 mutations activates the NOTCH1 pathway, highlighting the importance of the NOTCH1 pathway in CLL. Remember, we encountered NOTCH1 first in the setting of T lymphoblastic lymphoma, SF3B1 in the setting of MDS with ring sideroblast. But just, you know, these uh, mutations uh, affect other diseases too, including those outside of the realm of hematopathology other mutations listed here. They're all bad. Generally, if you have a mutation in CLL, it's associated with a slightly worse prognosis. For the moment, this doesn't hugely affect therapy other than for TP53 mutations. What have also been described with the use of targeted therapy against BTK, Bruton's tyrosine kinase, are mutations that are acquired in that gene and another gene in the pathway, phospholipase C, gamma 2, there are important genes underlying resistance to BTK inhibitors that can be found very early on in the disease uh, in many patients. There's some question about the biologic relevance. But what I did want to focus on just ever so briefly is the importance in knowing what BTK does. Bruton's tyrosine kinase is a uh, signaling molecule in B cells, and it's important, in fact, in B cell development. And some people, tend to confuse BTK with BTS. So I think it's important to distinguish at this juncture the difference between BTK and BTS. So this is BTS. Um, I'm sure familiar to all of you, a K-pop boy band, probably the most uh, popular band in the world. And I'm not just showing this to you for fun. Um, I'm showing this to you for those uh, trainees in the audience um, Sometimes in the heme path boards, they will ask you, show you not just microscopy, but figures of the members of uh, BTS, and you have to recognize and name the ad individual boys in this band. So please pay attention to this part. Thank you. Continuing on that theme, BTS should not be confused with XO. What is XO? XO, as you all know, and I feel sort of embarrassed telling you something you already know, is also a very popular K-pop boy band. And I'm sure, as you all know, in the recent past, they lost one of their major members. And a lot of people, myself included, went into mourning. But I think this was um, resolved, as some of you may know, some of you may not know, when a new a band member joined them. Unfortunately, since I'm not standing in front of you talking to you, you may not know, nor do I expect you to know what I look like. Uh, but you may have some idea. 
um, of uh, what uh, I look like based upon the most handsome uh, and slim person in this picture. Anyway, I digress, I'm sorry. If we go back to CLL, SLL, T53 mutations and deletions, about 90% of patients with chromosomal deletions of 17P have a mutation. Fewer with the mutation have the deletion suggesting some order or probably not as important as the fact that they tend to coexist with one another. And I sort of uh, alluded to this earlier in that the frequency of P53 mutations varies with stage of the disease. So about 5% of CLL patients will have this at diagnosis, 10% of the time of first treatment, 35% when they re relapse or have a refractory disease, and fully 55% when they transform. So it makes sense as the disease gets worse, uh, more likely to encounter P53 mutations. When next-gen sequencing first emerged, people tended to ignore minor clones and only concentrate on larger cones, clones as gauged somewhat imperfectly by variant elitic fraction, uh, but certainly small clones of P53 muta mutants are certainly are, are relevant in, in uh, CLL. Um, they are treated with venetoclax and do quite well for, with venetoclax therapy. Resistance develops, not so much, although there's some recent accounts to the contrary, with BCL2 uh, mutation, but other pathways uh, start taking over as these cancers become resistant to BCL2 inhibition. This um, graph here, this Captain Meyer survival plot, shows um, showing survival curves combining cytogenetics and molecular genetics. So combining not just uh, DEL11Q22, but also with uh, certain mutations like NOTCH1, et cetera. And you can see, and this is what I want to illustrate, if you have a um, 13Q14 deletion in isolation, the black line by, is the survival of age match controls. So patients with isolated 13Q14 deletion essentially have a normal lifespan, not that much different from patients, uh, age match individuals. If you've fallen asleep or not paid attention to the previous uh, series of slides on the uh, molecular biology of CLL, I think if you just look at the slide and ingest and uh, em em embrace yourself in the simplicity of the mutations and abnormalities in CLL from this slide, you will have uh, uh, acquired all the information you need. Wow, still talking about CL. With regard to CLL, the cell of origin, the dogma used to be that it's a neoplasm of naive B cells. Uh, there's a rare picture that still remains of the dog associated with that original dogma. A karma, as you know, ran over this dogma several years ago. There's the car, there's the karma police tip of the hat too. Radiohead and bye bye doggy. What am I talking about? It used to be thought that CLL was a neoplasm of pre-germinal sensor B cells, i.e. naive B cells, that have not yet encountered the germinal sensor. And we would know that by the fact that their immunoglobulin genes are not mutated. It was discovered quite long ago now that they're those CLLs that seem to have transited the germinal sensor because they got mutated immunoglobulin genes, and these are memory B cells. So biologically fascinating, turning the field on its head, but also clinically hugely relevant. Those patients with mutated immunoglobulin genes in their CLL cells, i.e. those that have transited the germinal center, have a very long survival, of, a median survival of 25 years. By contrast, those that have not transited the germinal center have unmutated immunoglobulin genes, a much shorter survival. So a very, very dramatic effect on outcomes. Uh, in the early days of this discovery, that we didn't have next-gen sequencing, and it was quite uh, cumbersome to sequence immunoglobulin genes involved cloning and many other things uh, that took a lot of time. So people looked for surrogates for the pre-germinal sensor uh, versus germinal sensor, post-germinal sensor type. People looked at CD38 as a potential surrogate. It is not a surrogate. People were more excited by looking at ZAP70 as a potential surrogate for pre versus post germinal center. It turned out it's not a surrogate. Um, and in fact, what emerged subsequently, if I go back and you look at the naive word over there, there's indications that even in so-called pre germinal center B cell type CLL, they have a gene expression profile that looks like memory B cells. So CLL has gone from a disease that was 100% naive to 50% naive, 50% memory, to a disease that some people, not all people, believe is 100% a disease of memory B cells. 
You may ask, how can you get memory without going through the germinal center? Speak to your immunologist friends, and they will tell you that not all memory is acquired by going directly through the germinal center, and hence acquiring the stamp on your passport or a visa stamp of having gone through uh, the germinal center. Sorry about that. You can also acquire memory in a non-germinal center, T-cell independent way. All right, that's it for uh, uh, CLL, SLL, hairy cell leukemia, if we are lucky enough to get a good specimen um, on peripheral blood, this is uncommon. You may see the classical cells with circumferential hairs. We now know that these cells in almost 100%, but not quite 100%, have a BRAF mutations, mutations of V600E uh, that are found in a number of different neoplasms. RAF sits over here, as you know, in the uh, growth factor signaling pathway, just uh, downstream of RAS and then uh, um, so it goes. Um, we also know that a disease called hairy cell leukemia variant that differs from, C, uh, from hairy cell leukemia morphologically, they tend to have huge nucleoli and also have a slightly different immunophenotype. And in addition, one flavor of hairy cell leukemia that uses this particular immunoglobulin heavy chain family lack BRAF mutations. They are BRAF negative, they are subsets, of hairy cell leukemias and essentially all hairy cell leukemia variants lack BRAF mutation, have instead MAP kinase mutations. We talked about them earlier in pediatric follicular lymphoma, where the MAP kinase sits just downstream of RAF. So this pathway is one that's hijacked in this disease. Other mutations are described in hairy cell leukemia. That's not just BRAF or MAP kinase mutations. We don't usually need to test for mutations in hairy cell leukemia because we have very robust immunophenotypic markers. So it's not a necessary test. I'll come to this in the conclusion. Um, as, as with many major medical centers, we at um, Penn had a problem uh, you know, with our immunophenotypic panel and could not afford to buy all these markers. So we set up an asset that worked quite well uh, to diagnose hairy cell leukemia, and that was incubating the specimen of blood in this reagent uh, for 10 or 15 minutes before making the smear. And this was quite useful in uh, uh, aiding us in making the diagnosis. Uh, you know, after all, this um, agent worked for me and there was no reason why it shouldn't work for uh, hairy cell leukemia as well. Apologies for those of you who don't know my particular uh, phenotype. Anyway, moving on to lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia, histologically, uh, cool Dutcher bodies, intranuclear invaginations of cytoplasm, often PAS positive, IgM positive in this disease that underlines Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. On cytology, bone marrow aspirate, you'll see lymphocytes, you'll see plasma cells, and you'll see cells in between plasma cytoid lymphs or plymphs, and typically IgM paraprotein, not always, but typically IgM. Uh, we also know, and actually it's a useful diagnostic clue in bone marrows, in patients with the lymphoplasmacytic neoplasm, for example, and you're not sure uh, whether it's LPL or, for example, another small B-cell uh, neoplasm with plasmacytic differentiation, say marginal zone lymphoma, the finding of mast cells in LPL is a very helpful diagnostic clue. There's something about the biology of LPL in which mast cells play an important role. In fact, the LPL cells um, elaborate CD27 ligand, which um, nourishes and induces uh, a growth of the mast cells. And at the same time, they make April or CD40 ligand important in keeping the LPL cells happy. So uh, mast cells are a very important part of the microenvironment of uh, LPL. I'm mentioning it because just from a pure microscopic point of view, you are likely to encounter mast cells uh, more often in the setting, and that can make you think about LPL. NYD88 is the gene that is uh, recurrently mutated in bones from macroglobulin anemia. MY doesn't stand for myeloma, it actually stands for myeloid. This uh, gene was first uh, learned to be of interest in myeloid cells. In any case, it turns out it's mutated in many, but not all, lymphoplasmacytic lymphomas, but it's certainly not specific. One disease that is often in the differential, or maybe in the differential, are um, uh, marginal zone lymphomas, uh, they too can harbor MYD88 mutations, ocular nexal marginal zone lymphomas, and fully a third of ABC type diffuse large B cell lymphomas harbor MYD88 mutations. 
Interestingly, those ABC type of fuselage B cell lipomas that harbor MYD88 mutations tend to occur in immune privileged sites, testicular, primary CNS, very high proportion of them have MYD88 mutations as well. In addition, another recurrent mutation in the setting of um, uh, LPL, not as frequent, are mutations of CXCR4. And this is important and relevant. If you've got an MYD88 mutation, you can predict response to abritinib. Once you have the coexistent, or less, less, albeit less frequently occurring, CXCR3 mutations, you lose response to BTK inhibition. All right, time for another quiz. Where are we now? Anybody? Japan. Thanks, Leo. Uh, not Japan. Helsinki. I have not been to Finland. I would love to go there. So Dublin. Is, sorry, say again. Dublin. I didn't hear that. Sorry. Dublin in Ireland. Oh, no. Um, this is actually in, well, you'll tell me in a second. So this is in a certain area of the city. Uh, again, I went hunting for murals, some very interesting ones there. This one, of course, is personally important to me. I don't know if Mahmoud Khalifa actually has joined us yet, but when we speak to one another, we always repeat this mantra to one another. So let's adore and endure each other. Uh, so this is very special to me and Mahmoud. Are you on the call, Mahmoud? Aha. All right. Moving along. Another mural in the city, in a particular area of the city. All right. So here's a clue to which city we're in. I don't know what this um, proclivity to take pictures of ceilings in famous buildings is all about. But does anyone recognize where this picture was taken? London. Right, this, uh, yes, thank you. It's the British Museum. They are the Elgin Marbles. And again, uh, you know, as parents, we were so proud of our daughter and the way she sort of studied all the classics before we went. It obviously was, you know, expensive to take her to Europe, but it was really money worth spending. Uh, so uh, this is a picture in the uh, British Museum. Here she is enjoying all the wonderful artwork in the Tate Modern Gallery ingesting and delighting in the pleasures in the Victoria and Albert Museum. You know, all of these pictures, I must concede, I took without her consent. She did at one point catch me taking a picture of her after shopping at Harrods, um, and you can see the disdain on her face. I don't really blame her. Uh, I'm not sure if that uh, facial expression and other forms of expression are better or worse. In this picture I took in Camden in London of, I don't know, punk still existed, uh, but this uh, friendly smile, but a not so friendly uh, gesture. Anyway, moving right along. Mantle cell lymphoma, we know, is associated with dysregulation of cyclin D1 as a consequence of the 1114 translocation. Cyclin D1 is overexpressed in this disease. Cyclin D1 overexpression is not specific, as you know, for small B for mantle cell lymphoma. Some diffuse large B cell lymphomas express it. In proliferation centers of CLL, we use. Uh, uh, cyclin D1 is a good way to distinguish from CL. You can see it sometimes in the proliferation centers and indeed in many other diseases, not all of which are in the differential diagnosis. Mutations, unsurprisingly common as well in mantle cell lymphoma. More important, perhaps from a clinical point of view, we don't need to test for these mutations. We have surrogates at least, although they're imperfect for T53 mutations, uh, uh, surrogates for proliferation signatures, uh, gene expression profiling, looking at these genes being, being overexpressed, haven't taken on clinically. We all know that we encounter every now and again cyclin D1 negative mantle cells. This is seen in about 10% of cases. They are still mantle cell lymphomas. They tend to dysregulate cyclin D2 and cyclin D3. Unlike cyclin D1 immunohistochemistry, immunohistochemistry for these cyclins is not useful. They can be physiologically expressed Doing the molecular testing or genetic testing is not straightforward, but there are RT-PCR assays uh, to pick these up and sometimes fish-based assays, but even those can be cryptic. So tough uh, 
to use genetics to diagnose a cyclin D1 negative mantle cell lymphoma. But of course, we have a very nice newish marker of SOX11 to diagnose these cases. Marginal zone lymphomas, three broad flavors, as you know. They tend to be associated with trisomies that can aid in the diagnosis. With regard to mutations, KLF2, NOTCH2 mutations, and protein tyrene phosphatase RD are recurrent mutations that I find sometimes useful in facilitating a diagnosis, at least the first two, which we look at in our panel. The last one, we don't. A diagnosis of marginal zone lymphomas, A20 mutations enriched in oculate nexal lymphomas, splenic diffuse red pulp lymphomas, uh, a mimic of splenic marginal zone lymphoma disease not commonly uh, diagnosed is purported to have its own series of mutations that are specific, but I don't think that's entirely true. We know that uh, marginal zone lymphomas at certain sites have characteristic mutations involving MALT1 uh, in the 1118 of MALT lymphomas in the stomach and lung, involving the immunoglobulin and heavy chain gene in other sites. Here are some of the numbers. I'm not going to uh, get bogged down with the numbers of frequency of involvement of MALT1 translocations in patients with marginal zone lymphomas that are found at extranodal sites. Another commonly uh, translocated gene, although rarely seen, is BCL10, another recurrently translocated gene, again associated with certain anatomic sites, is FOXP1. I'm going to skip this in the interest of time because I notice I am running a little bit behind. I wanted to emphasize, although we've talked about um, genetics in small B-cell lymphomas, we should not forget about the role of immunophenotyping. So again, if you can just have a quick peek at this slide and remember how um, immunophenotyping can help distinguish the various small B-cell neoplasms one from the other. This is an old table, very incomplete. So I apologize for that. But if you can just remember this, you should be fine. As people know, playing, uh, playing, Diagnosing uh, lymphomas is supposed to be fun, and sometimes we have fun and games to help us remember certain things in lymphomas, and sometimes we throw darts at a board to facilitate a diagnosis. So we can think of follicular lymphoma, mantle cell lymphoma, and marginal zone lymphoma listed here, or as distributed physiologically uh, in, in a lymph node. If you throw a dart and hit the bullseye, you get 10 points. So follicular lymphomas are CD10 positive, mantle cells just outside the bullseye, you get fewer points, CD5 positive mantle cell lymphomas, marginal zone lymphomas still don't have a characteristic marker that we can use routinely so they get no points, so they express neither CD5 nor CD10. Does anyone who know who that is? That's Parul Bhargava, a hematopathologist and very dear friend of mine, who actually came up with this idea of remembering immunophenotypic markers and small B-cell lymphomas. So I just wanted to acknowledge her. All right, we come to the end. Uh, summary slides. Follicular lymphomas associated with the 1418 translocation, absolutely not essential to make a diagnosis of follicular lymphoma. You should not be doing testing for it in all cases, not necessary. And we can make a diagnosis fairly easily morphologically. Nowadays, we have to do immunostochemistry. chemistry. However, for testing for the 1418 may be useful in obviously diagnostically challenging cases. You know, if you get a needle biopsy and you cannot tell really what's going on with, with absolute clarity, obviously you'd still prefer an excisional biopsy, but if that's not possible and you haven't got a good handle on the phenotype, uh, 1418 using a BCL2 probe uh, is going to be helpful. Some marginal zone lymphomas show follicular colonization, 1418, looking for it there may be useful. Um, and the opposite is that, there's, as we talked about, there are a number of uh, follicular lymphomas, five or six of them, that are actually defined or expected to be 1418 negative. And so finding their absence, if I can use such a term, uh, of the 1418 translocation can be diagnostically useful. Is this cutaneous follicular lymphoma primary cutaneous follicle cell lymphoma, or does it reflect disseminated disease? At finding that there is no 1418 translocation can be helpful. Mutations not yet ready for prime time, or at least hasn't taken off as a prognostic test. Mantle cell lymphoma, the 1114 translocation. I can't remember when last I ordered an 1114 assay. Uh, by cytogenetics, we've got a wonderful immunohistochemical surrogate. I really, really use it. Uh, gastric malt lymphomas, we talked about, but I'd skip that slide. The 1118 translocation, 
is not important for the diagnosis, but those gastric multilymphomas that harbor this translocation tend to be resistant to a therapy with antibiotics eradicating H. pylori. CLL, SLL, three things we can do, cytogenetics or FISH, immunoglobulin somatic hypermutation and looking for mutations, FISH somatic hypermutation and uh, mutations of uh, oncogenes and other genes are important prognostically and they may be important in terms of prediction of response to therapy. Um, for example, those with P53 mutations um, tend to do better or require anti-BCL2 therapy and it's also important to test for resistance mutations but very, very, very important. This happens all the time where I get clinicians requesting these assays to diagnose CLL. These, none of these is a diagnostic test. They're all of value not for diagnosis, but for prognosis. Hairy cell leukemia, BRAF mutations, very common. Usually don't need to test for them. We've got other very simple ways of diagnosing hairy cell leukemia. If frontline therapy with purine analog inhibitors uh, then you may you want to switch to a BRAF inhibitor, then you may need to show the mutation. But there again, you've got an immunohistochemical surrogate. LPL, two major mutations described, very useful for the diagnosis, not absolutely specific. Uh, some suggestions that the mutation positive cases do better and the wild type do worse. That's not consistently agreed upon, uh, but can be used for prediction of response to therapy, in particular BTK inhibitors. I thank you very much for your attention. Obviously, Sophia, pictured here in Central Park in London, uh, was totally overwhelmed by all the culture she uh, was exposed to and understandably is exhausted. I thank you again for your attention and I'll be very happy to take questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Adam, for, for that lovely talk. Um, does anyone have any questions about uh, the talk or any additional questions for Dr. Bag? Well, Adam, I can start with you. Uh, I have a question about, at Pennsylvania, what is your approach to uh, working up new diagnoses of lymphoma? Do you get a lot of uh, like quote lymphoma workups where uh, the tissue is kind of divided so that you get some fresh material for flow and for genetic studies in addition to permanent sections? Uh, yes, I mean, if there's sufficient uh, material, we almost always uh, attempt to, even if we get needle core biopsies, to have some fresh tissue, um, primarily for flow. We tend to use it for flow. As an institution, rightly or wrongly, we've never really routinely done classical uh, metaphase cytogenetics on these specimens. I kind of wish we had, but we do tend not to do it. Um, with regard to genetic studies, we can do, we have a lymphoma panel that we've had operative, for, uh, next gen sequencing panel that we've had operative for about 18 months. It's a panel that works on formalin fixed uh, paraffin embedded tissue. So we don't have a need to um, uh, save fresh tissue for that. And that uh, panel is variably used. Um, I'm in fact just with one of the uh, trainees working on a very large project to look at the utility of next-gen sequencing in routine diagnostics of lymphomas. <clears throat> the second question I had for you is about uh, cell of origin and transformed follicular lymphoma. I know some of them are deemed uh, ABC based on GEP, we tend to use the Hans algorithm. We don't have a, a GEP test that we use for assigning cell of origin, but do you have any suggestions on kind of approach for if someone has a history of follicular lymphoma and they transformed a DLBCL, uh, what are the guidelines for assigning cell of origin? Yeah, I mean, I think there are no guidelines. I think the expectation, uh, understandably, is that they're going to be um, GCBs rather than ABCs. We, too, use the... I've got to be careful what term I use. The, 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 the not wonderful immunohistochemical <laughs> algorithms, we use um, the HANS algorithm. Um, I've sort of been resistant to using those algorithms because we are all aware of their flaws. No sort of you know, direct commentary on the people who came up with these algorithms, but there are substantial limitations to them. We have not explored um, some of the or the commercially available uh, gene expression profiling uh, 
uh, technologies, uh, looking at cell of origin using nanostring technology. I'm sort of curious to observe that not many, I don't know of many laboratories that are actually using nanostring on a routine basis. And I think although for a two decades now, we've been sort of obsessed with cell of origin in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and its importance in prognostication and driving therapy, I think it has been, despite Lustau's prediction in the year 2000, 2001, that gene expression profiling is going to supplant pathologists completely. Um, that has not happened. And I understand that some clinicians now are actually uninterested in cell of origin with regard to diffuse large B cell lymphoma and using it as a, uh, a, a, a useful clinical tool, A for prognosis, B for directing therapy. Um, and, you know, people may be paying more attention in the near future to looking at, you know, mutational profiles and copy number variations. I love the two papers that came out, I think, in 2018 um, of two beautiful papers, you know, looking at the different clusters. And so everybody wants to look at that now until, you know, 10 years time or five years time when another technology supplants that. Sorry, so a bit of a long-winded answer to your well, I mean, I've, I, we see what the WHO recommends and a lot of it's institution dependent. So like in, in residency and fellowship, we didn't routinely assign cell of origin because the clinical teams weren't going to do anything differently. They didn't request it of us. But, yeah. you know, here in Minnesota, we use the Hans algorithm. And I think that that's what we agreed upon with the clinicians and we do it. But everyone recognizes that the IHC-based methods are imperfect. Yeah. And again, this may sort of die a quiet death, cell of origin and diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Mike, this is Betsy. Oh, hi. Is it okay to, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, thank you for that talk from a cytogeneticist perspective. It was um, very interesting. <laughs> it was great and also a bit provocative. So um, uh, just two comments. One is that um, when we do fish or G-banding, but particular fish at initial diagnosis, one of the reasons for that is to establish the pattern. About 10% of the translocations will be variant. That's the same across almost all <clears throat> reciprocal translocations that you have in any kind of malignancy. They're not the straightforward 1418. They've got a third partner or a fourth partner. And Frequently, what we're asked to do is to also weigh in on staging um, to see if there's any involvement of other tissues when they're looking. And sometimes fish is your, really your only way when you have that kind of minimal involvement so that we're establishing it not, we're establishing it at diagnosis, but really for also for use uh, further along in the disease. And then the second comment is, um, and it was great to see all of the genomic abnormalities. Um, one of the things that's kind of challenging with respect to looking at the prognosis of those different uh, genomic abnormalities is that the techniques for detection have really changed over time. So you have your standard G-bands that can tell you that the short arm of 17 is missing and therefore you're missing TP53. You can use the FDA-approved probe which is much larger than the TP53 gene. And then you can use, when we first started, using a custom probe that actually was much more to the size of TP53, so that if you use the commercial probe, you can miss deletions that are really limited to TP53. And now that people have moved over to microarray, you can see actually partial deletions and you've got a much better. But when you're looking at the kind of the combined literature, I think that it's helpful to actually sort out. Are you looking at something that was seen by conventional cytogenetics that would have to be five megabases or larger to even see it, and probably in a bone marrow sample or a leukemic blood, probably 10 megabases, coming down to then something that is a commercial probe, which is made for easy detection. Again, it's going to see large deletions, large duplications, but it's much larger than the actual target gene. Or are you going to be looking at that data relative to a copy number or a, a molecular assay that can tell, let's say, within NGS, a smaller deletion? So I just think those things are kind of right now, 
they tend to be um, mixed together, but mm -hmm. I think one might get clearer correlations if one sorted out those different types of detection. No, absolutely. Thank you very much for those uh, those comments. And you know, it is a, I think with a lot of the things we do, and perhaps more so in a field that's continually evolving, evolving um, for A, the interpreter of the test, knowing how the assay was actually performed, and then you know, moving towards an area where things are a little bit more standardized. And I think that is an issue. And hematopathologists and clinicians certainly need to be aware of some of the nuances uh, when different probes are used and obviously different technologies are used to pick up a deletion. Um, we, for some reason, and I don't know why, uh, we don't do array CGH, and uh, I wish we did, but we sort of use, you know, uh, G-banding karyotyping and FISH, but I wish we had array CGH. Uh, our pediatric hospital certainly does. Uh, do you use array CGH uh, fairly frequently? So we use, um, we do use arrays on, and I would say almost all the arrays that are used now are kind of a combination of the copy number by CGH, which we do actually use. Um, and then also they have that snip piece on them to be able to look at the loss of heterozygosity. Yeah. We actually have not yet switched over to um, using the arrays for CLL, but it is on the agenda of uh, Dr. McIntyre <laughs> um, because we believe that that particular, um, those particular abnormalities and being able to look at them with respect to uh, especially the loss of heterozygosity, et cetera, would be better played on a particular platform that we are anxiously awaiting <laughs> to bring okay. up in the lab and hopefully uh, very, very shortly. But um, right now we do not um, for CLL. We do run them upfront for every acute lymphoblastic leukemia and now for acute myeloid leukemias, dependent in part um, all pediatric cases for sure. And mm -hmm. it depends to some extent on the referring physician for the adult cases. I would say Mike, and you can weigh in, but for the adult ALLs, um, more and more that is an upfront and for the AMLs, but sometimes if you know it's a therapy associated or the treatment strategy is not going to change that much from what you would, the information you would have from other means, um, the physicians do not order it. But otherwise I think it's being incorporated upfront into um, almost all of the malignant tissues and we hope to move into solid tumors. Great, thank you. Do we have time for more question or time up? I think we have time for just one more question. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so nice presentation, uh, this uh, Dr. Day here. Uh, in the context of immunocompromised patients, you, you know, sometimes see this um, low-grade monotypic uh, lymphoid proliferation. So I'm just wondering, is your approach to walk up different when the patient is post-transplant, for example, uh, from when... No, patients is not. Do you factor in infection? Yeah, I mean, I think well, we, we, any post-transplant lymphoproliferation, we would work up uh, a, a, a initially as if it's going to be a lymphoma. I don't think we do anything particularly different. Uh, obviously, more inclined to look for EBV than in other uh, uh, B-cell neoplasms. But other than that, our approach is, is generally the same as we would as if it is going to be a lymphoma. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, it does, yeah. Thank you. Mike, Great, well. Mike, is it, is, it's Vanessa. Just one quick question that's a general thing. Uh, if anyone else wants to get offline while Dr. Dayton asks her question, that's fine. No, people just, need to get... it, um, I, I am an older hematopathologist, Dr. Bag. And um, something oh, I, okay, something that I have tried to push into the minds of my colleagues and um, the, the, the trainees for years is not to make too big of a diagnosis from too little information. And um, so I am extremely reluctant to make an initial diagnosis of a low-grade follicular lymphoma from a needle core biopsy. Your comments on what you do at Penn? Yeah, no, likewise. Um, invariably, no matter what I say, whatever verbiage I use will be included 
limited specimen showing X, and the X depends on the features, um, uh, excisional biopsy recommended. So I mean, always make that point. Um, I sometimes will go out on a limb in the note, but maybe not in the diagnostic line, about what the cytology looks like. Uh, but again, we'll emphasize that this is a limited biopsy and may not be represented. And similarly, I think growth patterns even obviously less reliably uh, determined on the needle core biopsy. Um, so, I'm, I mean, I might feel comfortable if I'm seeing classical cytology in the cells to call it follicular lymphoma C note and then talk about grading and growth patterns in the note. Um, but every now and again, if the cytology is not that good, I might just say germinal center derived B cell neoplasm C note. So obviously it depends on the case, but of course, very uh, cautious about um, definitely grading, uh, definitely growth pattern, and certainly uh, sometimes specific disease categories on needle biopsies in the setting of follicular lymphoma. Thank you for Great. reinforcing my beliefs. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for your attention and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Adam. I really appreciate you. Uh, Thanks.